35. In Exodus chapter 35, I'll bring you up to the context of the scripture we're going to read. Uh, Israel had come to the time of the furnishing of the, uh, the sanctuary for the tabernacle. It was to be their tent of meeting that would hold the Ark of the Covenant, be a place of worship and sacrifice, and would literally welcome in the presence of God. But there were things that were needed. And uh, in the beginning of the chapter, we see Moses expressing the need to the people that uh, they, they, uh, there was still remaining some garments for the priests, and they needed items for the service of sacrificing. So where we pick up the story, in verse number 20, we see the reaction of the people. And all the congregation of the children of Israel, Exodus 35 and verse 20, uh, departed from the presence of Moses. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing. They brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing hearted, and brought bracelets, and earrings, and rings, and tablets, all jewels of gold. Every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and red skins, of rams, and badger skins brought them. And let's uh, pick up in verse 29, the children of Israel, brought a willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. What a privilege it is to preach behind this pulpit. What a, a great honor to be missionaries representing this church. Lord, I pray that you speak through me, touch the hearts of the people here, and Lord, may we make decisions tonight that will affect a lifetime. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In the way that the children of Israel reacted to the need that was expressed by Moses is it's astounding. Uh, the people brought bracelets, earrings, rings, tablets, not those kind of tablets, but uh, all jewels of gold, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, red skins of rams, badger skins, silver, brass, shittim wood, onyx stone, stones to be set for the ephod, the breastplate, spice, gold for the light, anointing oil, sweet incense. And I can just imagine the scene as the uh, children of Israel went to their dwelling place and then brought things to uh, the house of God. And uh, I can just see them carrying out a, a load of things from uh, where they were staying at the time. And uh, in fact, one of the things that, that unique things uh, that, that catches your eye when you first get to Nigeria is not just the, the, the crowd of people, but uh, uh, the, the, the ladies, when they carry uh, a heavy load, they, they put it on their head. And uh, I remember when we first uh, worked with a veteran missionary, he had a lady that, that uh, helped his wife out. Her name was Blessing. And in their house, they, they were having a difficult time getting running water into the house. They had to go outside to a tank and fish from there. And, and even that tank dried up at times. And I, I saw the missionary send Blessing out to fetch some water outside the compound. And so I followed. I, I, I saw her take a 50-liter container and go walk out. And, and I saw her fill up that container of water. And 50 liters, 13 gallons and uh, lifted it up and put it on her head and walked back to the house. I took out a three by five card and I made a note never to anger that woman. <laughs> she was a tough woman. And uh, I, I did survive, amen. But uh, I can imagine someone looking on as the people were carrying things out of their dwelling places and going into the house of God and what if we were to ask them some questions of be easy for them to answer, what are you doing? They were bringing things for the furnishing of the sanctuary. They were bringing garments for the priests. They were bringing items for the service of sacrifice. But what if we ask them why? Why are you doing this? Why are you taking things from your place to a house of a God that you cannot see? Why, why are you doing this? 
Maybe I can ask you that tonight. Why do you serve God? Why are you here tonight? Why are you faithful? Why do you give? Why do you sacrifice? Why do you, uh, why do you work for God? I believe if you ask one of those Israelites that day, why are you doing this? The answer would be right there in verse 29, that last verse that we read. And it says, the children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing. I can see one of those Israelites gripping their chest and saying, it's my heart. My heart is making me willing to do this. I want that kind of heart tonight. I want the kind of heart that makes me willing to serve God. I want the kind of heart that forces me to do right. I want the kind of heart that when I come to a crossroads and, and, and I have the choice of whether to follow the way of the world or whether to serve God, I want the kind of heart that compels me to go the way of God. Amen. We can have that kind of heart tonight. We can see the description of the kind of heart that the children of Israel had at this time. Look at verse number 21. The Bible says, And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, everyone whom his spirit made willing. You can see, first of all, the children of Israel here had a stirred up heart. They just got excited about the work of God. When Moses spoke and expressed the need, their heart stirred up, and they were ready to do whatever was told them to do for the work of God. They were stirred up. And you, know, you ought to get excited about the work of God. It ought to excite you when somebody gets saved. It ought to excite you when, when, you, when you hear about, uh, when you see people getting <coughs> baptized and people getting discipled and uh, folks' lives getting changed. That ought, it, that, that ought to excite you. Yeah. I, I sit there, that, this is the fourth time that we've shown that uh, video presentation, the fourth church. And I'm still excited about that. Yeah. Now, we've had videos that we've shown 300 times, and I don't get excited about those anymore. But right now, it stirs me up. I can catch myself out my head at my very own video. <laughs> What was happening with the children of Israel? And I'm not talking about an emotion here. I, I'm talking about the children of Israel could work themselves up to serve God. They didn't have to have somebody hold their hand. They didn't have to have a special service. The need was expressed and they responded. And it wasn't always like that with the Israelites. In fact, <coughs> most times it was the exact opposite. In fact, if you look uh, at Towards the end of the book of Isaiah, uh, towards the end of the book of Isaiah, uh, the Lord takes an inventory of the children of Israel in the 64th chap chapter, and He says of the Israelites, "There is none that stirreth up himself. There was none. They could not work themselves up to serve God." And you see that throughout their history. They had a good king, had revival. Had a bad king, they went to apostasy. They had a good prophet or a good priest or a good judge, then they 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 served God. If they if they had a lazy priest or if they had a false prophet or if they had a bad judge, then they went after their idols again. There was and but God was looking for people in the nation of Israel who could stir up themselves to serve God. I'm guessing you described a big day on Sunday. It takes a stirring up of yourself to continue serving God after the big day. Amen. <laughs> because your flesh is not willing and you feel like you've done enough already, right? But God is looking for a congregation that can stir yourself up to serve God whether there's a big day or not. Whether there's a revival meeting or not, whether there's a conference going on or not, can you work yourself up to serve God? Yeah. And look, I, I, I realize personalities are different. And you may say, well, I'm just not like that. I don't get worked up. I don't get excited. I remember a pastor, uh, after I, I preached behind his pulpit, and, you know, I, I tell our people, I said, I change colors when I preach. I go from white to red. Our people get a kick out of that. They love that. And uh, they like it. I, 
and inside of here. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, they're very expressive, and so uh, I, I run around and I kick things over, and it's wonderful. I love it. Uh, but I remember preaching for someone, and they were taking me out to eat afterwards. And on the way to the restaurant, they said, well, you know, I just, I'm not like you. I don't get worked up and all of that over uh, the, over the sermons and things like that. And as he's explaining that to me, someone pulls out in front of him. You know what happened? He got stirred up. He hit the dashboard. He's pointing at the guy. He's yelling. And he looked at me, and I looked at him. He changed the subject. You, know, you get worked up about something. Did spend with their hands and brought that which. 
obviously it's spun, both the blue and the purple and the scarlet and the fine linen. In verse 21, we see the stirred up heart, I believe, for excitement. In verse 22, the willing heart for sacrifice. And by the way, let, let, me, let me make something very clear. Missions does not just stop on the mission field. We call on our people to sacrifice too. I don't just preach like this in America uh, and, 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 and hang this idea, well, they just don't have much. No, no. God blesses the sacrifice of his people, whether it's in America or it's in a third world country where people seemingly have nothing. <laughs> we have a missions conference every year. Our people give, at one time they were giving $300 a month towards missions, wow. above their tithes, above their offerings, giving outside the church walls to special projects that we could find in Nigeria, to new church plants, uh, to a, a, a Nigerian that was a missionary in Ghana, to a blind ministry, or a deaf ministry, and uh, uh, God blesses people that sacrifice wherever they are. Amen. We call on our people to sacrifice, <coughs> and they respond. They have a willing heart. But in verse 25, we see that the women that were wise-hearted, they took of a skill that they had, a talent that they had, if you will, and they could spin with their hands, and they brought that which they had made, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen. They could make clothing, and they used that skill that they had, and they dedicated it to the work of God. I, I just, I'm convinced that every single person in this room has something that God has placed in you that you can use for him. Something. Now, you may say, well, I can't stand in front of a group of people. We're not talking about that. I, I, I just can't teach a lesson. Okay, fine. Well, there's no way I could. I have people tell me, there's no way I could run a Bible college. Neither can I. I mean, but, uh, uh, and, 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 but those are things I, I've seen how God has gifted me in different areas. And I'm in a place where, wow, I, I, it's been a, a privilege to be able to use those gifts for his service. But don't put me under a car working on an engine. Amen. That's not me. I love it when, you know who my wife's favorite preachers are? Uh, it's not the person that, that is the greatest pulpiteer. It's the pastor that came and fixed our washing machine one year. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> she knows her husband ain't doing that. Yeah. Uh, listen, but, but he had a different gift. He had a different skill. He used it for God. And uh, look, there's something you can do for God. Every single person in here, there's something you can do for God. You say, well, I don't know what it is. Have you ever asked? When's the last time you went sincerely and humbly before the Lord and said, God, there's, there's obviously a way that I've stayed alive and provided for my family or been successful in business or something. There's, there, there's been a way you've been sustaining me and there's something you've put in me. How can I serve you? How can I use a skill that I have or a talent that I have? How can I give that to you? Don't be afraid to do that. I, 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 I worry sometimes that we're afraid to put ourselves before God and say, God, here I am. Tell me how you can use me. It doesn't mean you'll be packing your bags and going to Africa tomorrow. Okay? I promise you. There's something you can do right here at Faith Baptist Church. Yes, there's something you can do. Look, I, I, when I got saved when I was 10 years old, didn't go to uh, Bible college until eight years later. After Bible college, served in my home church for two years with my pastor, and God used us. God used us in, 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 the, in the ministry. I do believe it's the ministry of deputation. And, and look, God used us when we worked for a, 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 a missionary for almost a year. From the time I was called to preach until the time I became a pastor was 12 years. And God had something for me to do in those 12 years. God has something for you to do right here. Amen. <laughs> Have you ever asked him? You want to get real nervous, ask your pastor. <laughs> don't be afraid of that. He wants what's best for you. That's good. Yeah. Go to God. 
say, God, what, what is it that I can do for you? There's got to be something. When we first started Truth Baptist Church in May of 2006, we printed up uh, invitations and uh, I met a police officer inside the city, was running errands uh, inside near a hotel there, met a, a police officer on duty, and I gave him an invitation to our church, and his eyes lit up, and he said, I can walk to this church. And I was hoping so, because our, our church is just behind the largest police housing in the capital city of Nigeria. And, uh, and, and this man, his name is Republic. It's a big name. Uh, Republic Dakun. And uh, Republic smiled and, and uh, uh, he said, I'll, I'll be there. And, and he did. He kept his word. He came to our first evening service on May 14 of 2006. He went to Mass in the morning. <laughs> he came to our evening service that night. <clears throat> and I started visiting Republic. And every time I'd catch him at home, he had a, he had a job where he worked as a, a, a guard for one of the senators. And so anytime that uh, congressman would have to travel, he'd, he'd have to go along with him. So it wasn't often that I could catch him at home, but I did. He'd always pepper me with questions. You know, my priest says this, we do it this way in our church. I'd try to give him an answer from the Bible. And uh, for, for weeks, he would go to Madison Sunday morning, come to our church Sunday evening. And I remember driving by, uh, it's St. Peter and St. Paul Catholic Church. I saw they got big signboard for their programs and I noticed there at the very top it said Sunday morning first mass 6.30 a.m. I got an idea. I don't recommend this to everyone. Don't worry. But I went to Republic and I said you know if you went to that 6.30 mass you could make our Sunday school at 9 o'clock. And he did. I mean for three weeks he came. He went to 6.30 mass went to our Sunday school at 9 o'clock morning service 10 o'clock evening service 5 o'clock. That's the only time I've ever recommended somebody to go to Mass. Don't get worried about preaching. But, uh, uh, and I went to him after those few weeks, and I said, Republic, you're wearing yourself out. Said, you need to make a decision. I said, where are you learning more? He said, Pastor, my life's been changed in Truth Baptist Church. I said, why don't you come and join our church? The Republic said, Pastor, will I have to get baptized if I go to your church? I said, what do you think? He says, I think you're about to show me from the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. And I did. I showed him believer's baptism again from, from the Word of God. And uh, that Sunday, he brought his wife for the first time. I had the privilege of leading his wife to Christ. <laughs> baptizing them both on that Sunday morning. What a republic just caught fire. I mean... Uh, anything that, any time he was in town, he was just always there, always there. But he got frustrated because he, there were, there were uh, months where he could only come one Sunday or two Sundays in the month. He couldn't even be faithful because of his job. <coughs> and uh, we started praying together. And after the morning service, we tried to use him for announcements or as an usher or whatever the case may be, whenever he was around. And uh, uh, one morning service, he grabbed me and he said, Pastor, come and pray with me. And uh, we went after the morning service, and he took me outside, and uh, he took me to a car. He said, Pastor, God gave me a car. And it was a uh, Peugeot. Anybody know what a Peugeot is? Anybody here drive a French car or want to offend anybody? Because I'm convinced that Peugeot is French for garbage. <laughs> I don't like those things at all. But it was a gift, amen, and he was excited about it. And it was a Peugeot 505. And we laid hands on that thing and we prayed over it. And when I got finished praying, he said, Pastor, God gave me this car. He said, I've seen how you use a projector and a laptop. And we'll show conference DVDs to our seminary students, just getting more preaching in them. And he says, I want to take a laptop and a projector and a generator and load it up in the car. He says, I want to take the Jesus film and go to a village. He said, I know villages an hour or two hours from here, and I speak their language. Our country has over 200 languages. And uh, just, you, you can only, you, you don't have to go a half an hour outside the capital city, and you're in places where you need an interpreter, 
you're in, I mean, just absolute villages. And he did that several times, man. He loaded up his car with college students, and he'd go out to a village, empty out a village, by showing the Jesus film on the side of a building. Sometimes three and four hundred people coming out to see that film, and he'd stop it at the crucifixion, uh, the, the, the film, and preach to them. And scores of people got saved. Yeah. And it all started from somebody who couldn't even go to church every Sunday. But he just went to God and he kept praying. What can I do? There's something I can do for you. Show me what it is. Republic's gotten a couple of promotions now in the Nigerian police force. He's now uh, one, one rank above an inspector. He's an ASPN. And, uh, and, and so he's got an office job. He, can, he goes to the same place every day. He's at church every Sunday now. Uh, and he, he's one of our deacons. It helps to have a policeman as a deacon. Uh, <laughs> keeps me out of trouble. Uh, and he will, every day, every morning, he will look for the biggest city bus that he can find going into town. We have uh, uh, big, big city buses now that have uh, 80, 80 capacity. Of course, capacity means nothing in West Africa. We'll, we'll throw, it's kind of like an independent Baptist church, right? Yeah, people hanging out the window. We'll throw 130 people in those buses, you know, and, and it's just, but, but he'll look for the biggest bus he can find and jump on there. Now, our country and our city is, is half, I think they do this because the city is half Muslim, but they'll put signs on the bus that say, no preaching, city bus. And I guess it's just because they don't want uh, we, we have a lot of Christianity there, Pentecostalism, and they don't want the Muslims getting offended by uh, conversation and preaching and things like that. Well, Republic gets on there, full police uniform. <laughs> black shirt, black trousers, his name tag, I mean, medallions and badges of, of his rank and awards that he's a rewards and things like that he's gotten. And, and nobody says anything when he starts preaching. <laughs> traffic jams. <laughs> He'll call me sometimes at the end of the day and I can hardly hear him say, Pastor, it's, it's Republic. He said, I was preaching. I knew you were preaching Republic. Don't worry. He does it every day, all the way to work, all the way back. And, and, and uh, at least once a month, sometimes every week, I'll get a call from somebody asking, who's that policeman that gave me a track? I need to, I, I've had people show up to our church in tears saying, I, I had to come and see the place where a policeman is preaching on a bus and giving out tracts. In, in our place, the policemen are some of the most corrupt people generally. And they're just amazing. It all started when somebody went to God and said, God, there's something that I can do for you. Show me what it is. When have you ever done that? Sincerely and humbly. Go on to God. Say, God, show me what I can do. Show me what I can do. Stir up my heart. Make me willing to sacrifice. And give me that wise heart to do something for you. <coughs> heads are bowed, heads, please. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How's your heart? Tonight. That's about a nice close pastor. Well, that's great. We'll just stand together for a moment of invitation. Not a normal thing to have a Wednesday night invitation. That's too good a message to not take a moment. Well, Mitchell's play, you just take a moment with your heads bowed and you and God talk for a moment. Teenagers, that was for you. Uh, everybody, grandpas and grandmas. Are we available? Are we surrendered? something God would have us do. Perhaps you're not sure you're saved. Uh, we would love to take care of that. If you've been saved and not baptized, we'd love to take care of that too tonight. Or Sunday we can do it.
Thank you. 